Uh, let's talk to Kevin Schofield, police director at the Huff Post. Kevin, very good morning to you. Morning, Mike. I mean, I don't know about you, but I was quite um, stunned by that footage. I mean, it's absolutely quite remarkable what Elon Musk has been able to do. And we were watching um, a kind of a, a collage uh, uh, of things that he's done just in the past few days. And that includes the capture of this rocket, you know, the launching of a new driverless car, the launching of some robots that happen to walk around and speak to you and could possibly uh, engage themselves in any number of different tasks that you would normally do around the house. I mean, it's just incredible to me that Labour is uh, so against having him here. Yeah, well, I think this all goes back, doesn't it, to the spat uh, over the summer that Elon Musk had with the government and with Keir Starmer in particular over right. the riots. He talked about civil war, didn't he? There was going to be a civil yes. war in the UK. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of bad blood there. Every opportunity he got really on, on X, he uh, was having a pop at the government. So maybe... Maybe it's something to do with that. I think it's not that surprising, really. Well, it but might you're be, right. but it's a bit petty, but isn't right. it? It's but a bit petty. Time, you know, yeah, at the same time, you know, if you're looking to get investment in this country and, you know, we're told that um, the economy's on its knees and there's this black hole, et cetera, et cetera, and growth is the number one mission of the government, then maybe you don't want to um, turn your nose up at anyone who might be able to come here with a big fat checkbook. Well, quite. And I mean, you know, it's not as if we don't invite President Xi to come here. It's not as if we haven't had, you know, some pretty awful despots visiting Britain on state visits from time to time, quite often because of trade relations, which they might want to do. You know, it's very well known that we do an awful lot of business with Saudi Arabia. You know, uh, we do an awful lot of business with China. We do an awful lot of business with other countries in the world which might be considered to be, shall we say, you know, not people we agree with. So it just seems to me to be utterly ridiculous, really. Yeah, well, sometimes you do have to get your, your hands dirty, don't you, if you're in government? Um, yeah. And beggars maybe can't be choosers no. at the moment. Um, as they say, when the government is, says its number one mission is to grow the economy, if it does want to get investment from abroad, then obviously Elon Musk is a very, very wealthy man. And um, as you say, he has had quite a lot of uh, success in his business, business side, certainly in terms of um, technological breakthroughs. But I think maybe his... Um, over uh, his association with Donald Trump is maybe being um, uh, maybe another driving factor behind right. it. But again, if Donald Trump wins the election, you know, they're going to have to deal with Donald Trump and they're going to have to talk to Donald Trump and they're going to have to invite Donald Trump to Britain uh, to have conversations. So, you know, it's all it's all a bit, so it seems to me anyway, to be all a bit sort of, you know, sixth form common room stuff. Oh, we're not talking to Elon because he upset my friend, you know, Rachel. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, it is a little bit, a little bit strange. I mean, the, the government is obviously uh, shouting from the rooftops about the amount of investment that is is bringing in um, this week. It says in comparison to previous uh, investment summits. But you know, um, if you've got the the begging bowl out, maybe you shouldn't be uh, too choosy about um, who is dropping some pounds into that particular um, begging bowl. Yeah, and certainly the begging bowl at Labour has been going around for quite some time. You know, they still can't get out from underneath the Lord Alley scandal. I see today uh, we've got stories in the papers linking um, a friend of his to the new uh, ambassadorial job in the United States of America, uh, Baroness Amos, I think it is, um, who may well be qualified for the job. But, I mean, the, the fact is that the fact that it's being linked... To, to Lord Ali as if he's had something to do with recommending her is a problem for Labour, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, perception um, in politics is very important, as you well know. Mm. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Lord Ali won't be calling the shots as to who's going to be the US ambassador, but people will put Are two you? and two together. Well, you're he more sure given... than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people will put two and two together. He was given the security pass, wasn't he, to, to down the street. Yeah. That caused an awful lot of controversy, understandably. Um, they tend not to give those passes out willy-nilly normally. Um, obviously, the suits and the glasses and all the other things that he's, he's paid for, the close associations he's got with lots of Labour MPs. So any sort of association that he may have with someone that's in the running to be ambassador. The, the other thing to point out is, you know, there's been all sorts of names. Lord Mandelson's name was mentioned yeah. for, for this particular post, although I think he has... I think that was mostly by Lord Mandelson, wasn't it? <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> that may well be the case. So, you know, I think we're still quite a way off from learning who... That might be, but yeah, it's um, it's something that again, when it comes to perception, at a time when the government is trying to get back on the back foot, mm. these sort of headlines certainly don't help. No, they don't. And again, still the Taylor Swift headlines carry on because at the Sunday Times, I think it was at the weekend, had the story that the Attorney General uh, was now involved in trying to talk to the police and trying to get some kind of, um, you know, special treatment for Taylor Swift. And it's on the front now of the Daily Mail. Um, Starmer faces calls for an independent inquiry and claims ministers improperly interfered.
Vettel is now asking uh, again for for a sort of uh, uh, an investigation. And again, it's just it's another story that's not going away. It's not, it's and it's it been a bit of a slow burner, this story, yeah. you know, it came out last week. Initially, it looked as though, I mean, it was a good story, and it was a sun book story. Yes. It was a very interesting story, but it didn't seem to be going anywhere, but then we subsequently learned that Yvette Cooper, who we didn't think had got tickets to see Taylor Swift, right. got them by virtue of her husband, Ed right. Balls, and now, at the weekend, yeah, we, we discovered that um, the Attorney General, the Chief Law Officer, also got on the blower, it would mm. appear, to the Met after they had initially said that she didn't deserve um, the blue light treatment. So, uh, so you see these questions again for mm. the government to to ask to answer this morning. We'll no doubt be asking the uh, Prime Minister spokesman at Morning Lobby today yeah. exactly what they've got to say for themselves. Now they insist that it's an independent decision by the Met. However, the Met had initially said no blue light. Yeah. Politicians get involved, and lo and behold, they change their mind. So, yeah, it certainly does seem to be quite a lot of questions still remain unanswered. And this is the problem. I mean, this is the new Downing Street, by the way. This is meant to be the newly kind of, you know, open and uh, and more efficient communications machine um, because, of course, Sue Gray has gone. Sue Gray was supposedly the problem. Um, but they don't seem to have got any better at it because they had Lisa Nandy out last weekend defending um, Yvette Cooper, saying, oh, I don't think she went to Taylor Swift. And you kind of think, well, how can you get that so wrong? You know, if you're supposed to be in government, you're supposed to speak collectively, you're supposed to... We've got Louise Hay slagging off P&O and then coming, uh, having Keir Starmer forced to come out and say, oh, she doesn't speak for the government. Well, if she doesn't speak for the government, why is she still Secretary of State for Transport? Yeah, that, I must say that was a really strange one. You can't have the Secretary of State for Transport not speaking for the government on a transport issue. Right. It's utterly it's ridiculous. bizarre. And you're right, there does seem to be a lack of um, control, really, uh, within the uh, government within mm. number 10 is to what ministers, as you well know, Mike, when ministers go out on the morning round, it can get a bit boring for people like us that keep saying the same thing again and yeah. again and again, but that's meant to be their job, you know, they stick to the line yeah. so they don't drop themselves and the government in it, but there doesn't seem to be much of that um, going on at the moment. And, uh, yeah, the the uh, new regime in number 10, I think it's safe to say, is still properly to get into its stride and mm. who knows when that who, who knows when that will be right and meanwhile we get more news over the weekend of Keir Starmer removing yet more paintings it's almost as if he's got some kind of phobia you know he's now being famously quoted as saying he doesn't have a favorite book he doesn't have a favorite um, play he doesn't really have a favorite poem he doesn't apparently now really have a favorite painting and every time he sees a painting he wants to remove it he's ta now taken um, since I last spoke to you apart from Margaret Thatcher going first he's now taken Gladstone down he's taken Queen Elizabeth the first and now Sir Walter Raleigh. Yeah, although when you read the story, and uh, Downing Street apparently told the Telegraph, I think I've got the story this morning, they told the Telegraph last night that this was um, organised by the previous government. This was already in train. It's to mark 125 years of the of the government art collection. So this was always the plan was to um, remove those uh, pictures. <laughs> I'm not buying it, sorry. Okay. I'm so not buying it. We'll see. All we can do, again, this could be another question we can ask again, the number 10 um, spokesman. I'm sure they will get asked that this morning, so we'll see what they have to... Yeah, I don't think we've got one this morning. They don't give them to us very often, uh, and then they take another break after every time they come because they don't really enjoy it very much. Uh, but yeah. there we are. I mean, as far as the um, uh, the business of, of government goes, they were sort of trying to boast about their first 100 days, weren't they, over the weekend? And that sort of backfired a little bit as well because, of course, the Tories put out the real achievements of the first 100 days and, and that actually, I think, did better than the Labour version. Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? When you talk about the, the first 100 days, people tend to focus on the many, many things which have gone wrong, winter fuel payment, Sue Gray, you name it, um, having to suspend seven Labour MPs for voting against the government, all this type of stuff, you know, yeah. that tends to grab the headlines. So, yeah, I can understand why the government might want to try and put a positive spin on And it's not it's not as if they've not done anything, but just unfortunately for them, all the bad stuff has completely drowned that out. And again, that's another challenge for the communications people in number 10 to try mm. and get out that, that positive message, because there's no doubt that the overarching theme right now, and, and it's reflected in the opinion polls, that he's had a bad start to... Um, his time in office and he's going to have to try and turn it around very quickly, not least with the budget coming up in just a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Now, just one final one on David Lammy. Um, have a look at this uh, clip from what he said in 2018. I'm afraid as Caribbean people, we are not going to forget our history. We don't just want to hear an apology, we want reparation. 
Now, he's now the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. Um, I presume he's going to be at the Heads of, Co at heads of Government uh, meeting uh, in Samoa coming up later on, uh, I think, this month, next week. Uh, if he's asked to provide reparations, does that mean that he's going to supply them? Uh, no, I think that may well be another occasion where uh, the Prime Minister might turn around and say he's not speaking on behalf of the government. Or he certainly wasn't <laughs> back in back in 2018. No. I mean, yeah, but you're right, it's a justifiable question. If that's what he thought in 2018, mm. surely he must think the same now. So, again, it's another example maybe of, of David Lammy, the comments of the past, maybe coming back to haunt him. Obviously, we know that he was very critical of Donald Trump yeah. in the past. Were Donald Trump to win the election next month in America, then there's a very good chance that David Lammy will be interacting with, certainly with the, Donald Trump's administration. Mm. Um, and so we may have to well roll back on what he said before. So, so yeah, again, good good fodder for guys like me and you to ask David Lammy the first chance we get if he still believes, if he still agrees with what yes. David Lammy said back in 2018. Well, I can't imagine he'd be able to find any money since they haven't got any, um, unless they perhaps get some from Elon Musk, maybe, and use that to oh. give reparations. Thank well, you very much. Well, that's the problem. That, that is a problem. You can't get blood out of a stone, can you? No. I guess if they've got no money, then it's going to be difficult for them to meet any other, not just this financial demand, all sorts of financial right. demands going forward. Exactly right. Kevin Schofield, thanks very much indeed.